This week on Tequila Sunrise, we wrap up the second part of our discussion with Kevin L. Jackson, starting with the question, what is your superpower? Why he owes his effectiveness to his wife, blockchain, crypto securities, and diverse supplier networks. There's a lot you can learn from Kevin, so listen up. It's time to wake up to Tequila Sunrise, where, without the aid of tequila, unfortunately, we open your eyes to how tech, founders, and venture investing ticks. Focused on supply chain tech every week at this unholy hour of the day. So if you want to know how tech startup growth and investment is done, join me every single week for another blinding Tequila Sunrise. Greg White here from Supply Chain Now, always happy, never satisfied, willing to acknowledge reality but refusing to be bound by it. My goal is to inform, enlighten, and inspire you in your own supply chain tech journey. Subscribe to Tequila Sunrise on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else you get your podcasts so you don't miss a thing. We open the second half of this conversation with Kevin L. Jackson with what is your dysfunction? Yes, it's the question we ask everyone to discover what their secret superpower is that some folks might consider a disadvantage. Listen up. All right. So this is a question that has become sort of a trademark for the show. And I'm just going to apologize in advance. Oh, no. Let Let me give you let me give you some perspective on this question. I, I have come to believe that great people tend to take what others might objectively or even subjectively consider to be a flaw or dysfunction, and they use it to their benefit. If you were to explore your being and think, and I don't mean for you to dig real deep, but I mean, <laughs> you know, is there something off the top of your head that someone might go, you know, that's odd, that's a failing or even a dysfunction that you, oh, yeah. you feel like you use? Yeah, two things, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm messy. You only you, what you see on the screen is the only neat part of my entire office. <laughs> Love it. Selective okay. camera work. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because I hate the details. I, I hate the nitty gritty of putting one foot in front of the other. You know, I like to think of the endpoint and be there immediately. Yeah. In some ways, uh, that makes me kind of a, a bad follower. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm, yeah. No doubt. I'm, 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 you know, I'm horrible. I'm horrible if I put in a, if I'm put in a position where I can't contribute to the team, where I'm told to do one, two, and three. You know, mm-hmm. don't think about it, just do it. And that's gotten me in quite a bit of trouble. <laughs> in, yeah. In a lot of ways. But what it also has enabled me to do is what we talked about earlier. I, even when I am part of a team, I can interpret and have empathy with all other members of the team. And that has, over the years, has made me a much better team player. I have to give credit to my wife. She, <laughs> she taught me that not everyone thinks the same way that I do. So it's important for me to uh, understand that your way is not always the only way mm-hmm. um, and understand that, appreciate that and and leverage other viewpoints as you move forward. Don't just push them away. And that's taken me a while to, to learn and to do, but that's really accelerated my personal view of myself and it's enhanced my ability to contribute to society. I just wanted to important? leave a little silence there for that, because I think that's something that people should recognize is that other people have distinctly different viewpoints. Yeah. And those viewpoints can be valid, right? They have a, yeah. may have a distinctly different way of approaching life and it can work for them. Yeah, that's a great 
awakening. I recall having a similar awakening. I just think that's really powerful for, for people to think about. And it's something we could really, really use <laughs> right now. Yes, right? absolutely. Is that, that there are other ways to look at the world and they are equally as, as valid as your viewpoint. How, how do you turn that thing that objectively somebody else's point of view might say, oh, that guy's messy or he's too concerned about the details or he forgets about the details or whatever it is, but turn that to your advantage and acknowledge that and almost treat it as a superpower. I mean, if you think about, we didn't talk about this when we were kids, Kevin, but now they talk about what makes superheroes superheroes. And sometimes it is a dysfunction that they use to enhance their greatness. Right. So I, I can ignore the details and look towards the future. And that's why I do strategy and I don't do right. tactics. <laughs> right. Right. And, and, and you know, you need a wing person to I need take care of those to do details. The tactics for me. Yeah. Yeah. Because you leave jet wash. <laughs> right. right. You, you leave a jet wash of details. Yeah. All right. Well, so let's let's talk a little bit about your current initiatives, GC Global Net, you know, and some of the partner firms that you work with and the main challenge that that addresses. So I've done just a little bit of mm -hmm. research there and I'm fascinated by what you're doing there. Well, you know, GC Global Net, actually, it's a, a rebranding of my company we launched in 2013 of a Gov Cloud Network. I mean, right. I was working in cloud computing and in the government. I had colleagues and other companies that wanted to work with me, but didn't want to work with the company I was uh, an executive of at the time. <laughs> so they kept pushing me. <laughs> Why don't you start your own company? Start your own company <laughs> so yeah. we can work with you. So I said, uh, okay, you know, so I, you know, took the plunge and started GovCloud Network. And I thought it was going to be about helping government contractors and government agencies jump onto the cloud. Because at the time, it was Vivek Kundra was the uh, chief information officer during uh, uh, President Barack Obama's term. And the government was uh, surprisingly leading, at least right. in the United States, to uh, everyone in the cloud. And then things sort of got bogged down. And uh, but my very first contract, though, I mean, as soon as I started my company, I got an immediate contract of about $10,000 a month. And then I got another one. And I would say, wow, this, this stuff is easy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Until like three months later, they stopped the contract for no reason at all. <laughs> just yeah. Because they wanted to. Early success will do that to you in a startup, <laughs> won't it? You're like, oh my gosh, why didn't I do this before? And then yeah, right. reality hits. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and the government sort of slowed down and I started shifting towards support, supporting the commercial world because the commercial world started jumping on the bandwagon. But there was a lot of misunderstanding about cloud and uh, particularly the fact that it wasn't about technology, that it was really new business models and new acquisition models and, and uh, new security models. So education became the most important aspect of transitioning to cloud. So I started teaching about cloud. And that's when I wrote my first book, because it was part of uh, a methodology of, of teaching others about about cloud computing. Um, and what's and that book, Kevin? Called? So the very first one was cloud computing for the business of government. <laughs> okay. okay. That sounds okay. really interesting, Kevin. I know. That, and that's why nobody read it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to pick that one up for the beach. But... <laughs> It, but, but, you know, I learned a lot, too, of not to do when you write a book. But I sort of transitioned to training and education. And then I started consulting. And then the social media thing sort of blew up because I didn't I didn't have enough money to hire somebody to do marketing for my company. So I wound up using social media because it was free. <laughs> right. Love it. Because it was early, as social media grew, uh, my reach grew as well. And then we we rebranded to uh, GC Globanet because most of our work was in a commercial space. Uh, we started working with a lot of large companies, like I said before, like Microsoft, IBM, AT and T, and so forth. And last year, the uh, Diverse Manufacturing Supply Chain Alliance right. was very interested in 
leveraging cloud and advanced technologies for manufacturers and supply chain. I think you do something about supply chain, right? <laughs> I, I know a little bit. Okay. Maybe you a know, tiny bit I, about cloud yeah, as well. Yeah, well, you know, I, I never did supply chain at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So actually he came to me and said, uh, do you know anything about supply chain? I said, no, I know nothing about supply chain. He said, well, we want to, you know, we want think blockchain to be good for supply chain and cloud to be good for supply chain. I said, I know those. Yeah. <laughs> I know blockchain. I know cloud. Yeah. Oh, you want to apply technology to supply chain. Oh, yeah, I can do that. That's no problem. So that's that was the genesis of Source Connect, which right. is a B2B e-commerce platform that leverages blockchain and cloud for diverse manufacturers. And uh, I know you you know David Burke. Right. So we both uh, teamed up to create Source Connect. And that was kind of timely. That was in November last year. And then we, we actually had the platform up and running around February. And that's when COVID hit. Right. And all of a sudden, the world's supply chains broke because uh, we couldn't do anything physical. Right. Everyone had to go home. Everyone had to work remotely. Virtual became the key to moving forward. And we just so happened to have a virtual platform for supply chain. So uh, Source Connect was sort of the right thing at the right time. Since then, we've grown from having five companies on the platform to today, we have over 21 plat uh, companies on the platform. And we've partnered with IBM and the Trust Your Supplier network that leverages blockchain for information. And then we leverage blockchain for actually managing e-commerce for, for B2B. Uh, so that looks like a, a good thing as about 80% of the whole market is shifting to contactless, remote, virtual business. This wasn't even a priority when we, we started Source Connect. You know, companies knew about the technology but it was something that they would do over the next four or five years. Right. But when COVID hit, it became an immediate requirement. And it's kind of interesting because about the same time the federal government started looking at crypto securities. I mean, everyone has heard of Bitcoin, but the underlying technology is a, a distributed ledger technology. Right. And the distributed ledger technology keeps track of transactions. For, for Bitcoin, they're financial transactions. But if you're in supply chain, if you're buying a, a product or a service, it's a transaction also. So you can apply the distributed technology or blockchain to supply chain to support, provide visibility, to reduce friction and to reduce cost. Uh, and so error. that's you know that's what Source Connect is doing. Yeah. But at the same time, the, another company called Dealbox was leveraging uh, distributed ledger technology to do the same thing for securities. Typical company when they want, need money, you need to go out and raise funds or raise capital from investors. Mm -hmm. And that's called an IPO, where they would sell shares of the company in exchange for money. Well, with crypto securities, it's essentially the same thing, but you use distributed ledger technology for coins. So it's crypto, crypto securities on a distributed ledger. So you can sell a token in exchange for money. So it's a share of a company. And that's what Dealbox does. It uses digital ledger technology for security and the exchange of securities. And about two months ago, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States actually modified the rules so that you can actually do that. So you can, instead of doing an IPO where you sell shares, right. you do an ICO right. where you sell tokens 
for securities. And that's how I got involved with uh, Dealbox. They are, they are building an entire ecosystem built on top of crypto securities that include things like digital names, that's uh, TNS, where you can have a cryptographically protected identity that you can leverage across any type of transactions that you may have, be it coins, securities, or even supply chain. We are going to be working with the uh, Telecommunications Industry Association to actually create a blockchain consortium across the telecommunications industry mm. so that you can leverage things like your s- smartphone for crypto identities and crypto security and exchanging your Bitcoin. Does that make sense? Wow. Yeah, totally. I mean, first of all, I think, I mean, you can see where your passion for for vision <laughs> talked about and and for technology have met a, a fantastic confluence. And, you know, we talk a lot about how people are struggling to figure out how to use some of these advanced technologies, mm-hmm. particularly in my case in supply chain, but anywhere really. And with Source Connect, for instance, you're using it to verify the vendor to verify their sourcing, to verify the the transactions and the agreements between, say, a tier one vendor and an OEM or something like that. Absolutely. So you can also prevent counterfeits in the supply chain by by doing that. Yeah. And and, and verify transactions. Exactly. Right. I mean, you can verify a physical transaction like the handoff of one product to another. Mm hmm. I see a a ton of applicability in the supply chain. I love the idea of, and I've only ever seen it on television, Silicon Valley, the (laughs) the ICO, right? The whole create your own coin to fund your company kind of thing. But you can see it. Look, blockchain in and of itself is an immutable, unchangeable record. It's forever and it's forever the way it was registered. It eliminates, as you said, counterfeiting, it eliminates tampering, and it allows verification and provenance of product and congruity between companies and verification of not just transactions, but agreements and qualifications to say you are who you say you are. Those sorts of things are really important, especially as the world has become and will become even more so virtual. Exactly. How do I know you're Kevin Jackson? (laughs) <laughs> and that visibility that's afforded, um, as Dealbox says, it democratizes the world in a lot of yep. ways. All of the deals that are made in the back rooms smoking cigars of the good old boys go away because you have this distributed ledger that has the light of sun on it. Yep. It, it creates a transparency that has is hasn't been available until now. Right. Some of these things that you've talked about and some of the things that you've dealt with in the past and some of what you're dealing with today and that you wrote a book about. Right. Is another amorphous concept that like blockchain that I think people don't quite understand digital transformation. So so tell us a little bit about what you've experienced with the myths or misconceptions or misapplications of digital transformation. Why you felt compelled to write a book about it, guiding people through that process. Again, educating. It's what you do. Right. It's, and, it's about education. But yeah. But, and or, you know, what kind of what are your key thoughts or what do you hope the book helps people accomplish? So the book is Click to Transform, correct? Yes. The foundational aspect of it is that information is created from data. And if, if you can identify the source of data, you know, where this data is created, and a sink for the data, who needs that data to either make decisions or to take action or to create value, then you could form a business model that connects the data source to the data sink. And the business model is really about creating and marketing information about the value of that data flow. Now, that's a pretty simple concept but you can apply it to any industry and to any process. That's the definition 
of digital transformation. So for the dummies that we have in the audience, not me, of course, <laughs> I completely get it. So give us an example of you know, yeah. the application as you describe it. There's tons of examples. One that many of you are all familiar with is Uber. Uber is the largest taxi company in the world, but it <laughs> owns no physical assets. It right. owns no taxis. It knows a door, a data source. This is people that are willing to give a ride. You have a data sync, people that are looking for a ride. Right. So the business model is connecting that data source to the data sync and marking it its availability. So that's Uber. They leverage cloud computing and machine learning and artificial intelligence to make that value known. That's a digitally transforming the entire transportation industry. That's exactly what Travelocity did with airlines. That's what, that's what Kayak does for hotel rooms. That's what Airbnb does. Just about every new business that that is disintermediating the large established businesses are doing that. They are identifying data sources, data sinks, and then they're leveraging cloud technology basically to deliver information reliably and quickly to those that can accept and use that value. Any company in today's world needs to understand that process so that they can reduce the cost, improve the value, and expand their own business model, independent of the in industry vertical. This is exactly what's happening in supply chain. So let's talk about how that impacts uh, existing companies, not companies that are disrupting or disintermediating a existing industry. But let's say you're a manufacturer, right? Right. You know, I've heard people even consider going from pen and paper or spreadsheets to a packaged or customized solu technology solution called that digital transformation. Do you agree with that assessment? And it, and whether you do or not, give us an example of, of what you see as digital transformation in an existing non-technology type business. So it really doesn't matter what type of business you are, if it's technology or not technology, you have made investments in your existing business model. That is, many call it technical debt. Now, technical debt is not necessarily technology, but if you buy a building because you need to store physical things, that's an investment, that's a debt, and you still have that on the books. Many companies have technical debt that they can't just wave their hand and get rid of. They also have existing models and processes that depend on physical things. And it's been working well, but this physical interaction is becoming less and less important in the world. But they still have that debt. And it's really hard for established companies to rethink their processes and to wipe that debt off of their books. So they have to do, so yes, changing from pencil and paper to a, a spreadsheet is a small step towards digital transformation, but you have to have a lot of those steps and it takes time. It takes training. It takes change, takes time. Uh, so it, it's a slow process. Yeah. You know, some say it's like, taking the aircraft carrier or the uh, cruise ship and, and turning it. You know, it takes miles and miles to, to turn it. Whereas new companies don't have that prior investment, don't have that technical debt. They don't have that reliance on an old process. They can just take a couple of credit cards, buy some cloud infrastructure that they don't even own right. and try something out. And if they fail, they fail. They just do it differently the next time. That's speed. And that's where the world is today. So that's why all these large companies, typically what they, what they do is they will start their own new code, as they, they, they call it. 
so that the new company can create new processes um, and leverage technologies like cloud and machine learning uh, and distributed technology. And then they slowly wean themselves off of the old processes. So a couple things I'm taking away from that one is maybe I'm projecting this, but it aligns <laughs> with what I what I think, which is if you are a big company, you better form a new co because as I've said in the past, and I'm not the only one, you either are the disruptor or the disrupted. You're not yes. um, right. And exactly. and basically you're creating an entity or organization within your own company to disrupt your business processes and to digitally transform them. And the other that I take away is that just because you've plugged in technology, you have not necessarily created a digital transformation. It is about your right. business processes and the way that you do business going forward as well. Is that fair? Absolutely. It's These are new business models. Yep. And, and, and it's not, it's not paving the cow path. That, <laughs> right. It's not a faster horse, yeah, it's right? not which is what people were horse. asking Henry Ford for, right? <laughs> Want a faster horse. Uh, it is a completely different path. Completely different path. Yeah. Instead of having a pile path, you have to build a bridge that goes over the forest. That's fantastic. And, and I, I presume that the book is a guide for folks that want to undertake these digital transformations, right? Is that what your goal? Absolutely. So the book really lays out that digital transformation is about new business models. I talk about hybrid IT, the blend of traditional data centers, managed service providers, and cloud services that any large organization will need to have. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about some of the essential functions that today are implemented through APIs or application programming interfaces, things like data security, machine learning, blockchain. And I talk about how data is important in creating these new business models, understanding data and identifying data sources and those data sinks and how there are, there are a set of like seven new business models built around data that you can apply to any industry. And then finally, in, in the end, I talk about different frameworks for redesigning your business models. So it, it's really a cookbook on how to understand where you are in your industry and how to disrupt your industry to become a leader. That's really useful. And I think that companies, they need that definition. They need the, the greater understanding that it's not just plugging in software. It is changing how you do business. It's changing and, how you do business. And a guidebook, a playbook for doing that is uh, so valuable and so so fitting with your compulsion, <laughs> right? Your, I'm, uh, I'm living your it, right? obligation to help people be better, right? I think I've... I've nailed the, this down, but I'm going to ask you, I think what would be really valuable to kind of enlighten our community would be to share some insights on finding a calling or recognizing your gifts and tackling that with the gusto that you clearly do so that you don't think of it as work. Any tips or guidelines or guidance uh, for folks on on how to do that. I just think that the joy that you have in the work that you do and the value that it brings to so many people, I, I'd love for, if there's just any small tip you could give folks to help them have have what you have. Well, absolutely. There's this too. First of all, expect change. Change always happens and look for look forward to change. And the, the second is don't do something that you don't enjoy. If, if you're not enjoying it, you can't be successful. It's impossible for you to be successful. So if you're not enjoying it, change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have to- you have That's to why just, you have to embrace change. You just have to you know, accept change, expect change, and drive change in everything that you do and, and, and drive to a better place to enjoy what you're doing, to enjoy life, to uh, feel good about yourself when you wake up in the morning. So 
I sense you didn't know that your whole life. And I'm guessing no, that there you learn that, right? Yeah. I'm guessing there are other things you didn't know your whole life. So <laughs> if you look, if you look back, what do you wish you had known earlier in life? And what do you think that might have changed? Or what recognition of that helps you as you go forward? Well, one thing that I didn't know early in my career, I guess I didn't really know till late in my career, is the value of others. You know, you say that you are your network and your network is your linkage to other people. And that network provides you your strength and your insight. And it's important as an individual to treasure, build, and nurture your network. When I was young, it was all about me. It was how, what I could do, what I knew, what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I didn't appreciate the value of others until I became later in life. And uh, I started to see the value of the people that I had met along the way. And the fact that sometimes they helped me, sometimes I helped them. And it was that give and take that improved both of us. Um, and the more linkage that you make with others, the more opportunity you'll have to help others and the more opportunity others will have to help you. So it's all about having a, a mutually supportive network around you. And that's what business is. That's what life is. That's what family is. And, and all of those networks need to reinforce each other. Don't go it alone. Yeah. Don't go it alone. Considering where you are in your career, which mm -hmm. for me is really hard to gauge, because uh, I think you're the only person I know that has more jobs, if that's what you want to call it, than I do. <laughs> but let, uh, let's take a li little bit broader view. If you think about not just career, but just the world or where, you know, whatever is on your mind. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what are you particularly at peace with right now? And what are you curious or concerned about these days? I'm really at peace with, with my network, with the people I work with, my family, my colleagues. I think I've done well by them and, and they do well by me. But what's, what's really troubling, though, is that it seems that many of us are trying to get into our own shell. There's so much division. There's so much he said, she said. There's so much, you know, you don't know anything. You, you know, uh, I know what's right. You, you only do things that are wrong. There's no empathy. There's no cross-pollination of ideas. And I think that's just a, a train wreck. <laughs> yeah. Tribalism. Right. Tribalism. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if you're a fan of uh, Stephen Covey, but particularly seek first to understand. Yes. Is so valuable. And I think particularly poignant that. and necessary in this time. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, I could I can I I, th I hear a lot of people who have the same concern, by the way, a lot of people of varying backgrounds or lifestyles or nationalities. And what I find comfort in is that so many of us are concerned about that. That yeah. has to come around to goodness at some point. I believe so. And I believe there's a minority that ignore that truth. Unfortunately, it's a very vociferous yes. minority. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. That's not always the, easy, you know, those kind of questions are not always the easiest things to share, but what, it, what would you like to share with, with our listeners, with our community that we haven't talked about today? Wow. We've, we've gone over just about everything. I was, I mean, awesome. <laughs> you've made me pour out my entire book, right? <laughs> my life. And I have no more secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't mention every job. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but but in essence, I enjoy what I do and I want to help others enjoy what they do. And there's there's so much value 
in collaboration. I like to open myself up. I'm open to collaboration. I'm hoping that others are open to collaborating with me. And, I, you know, hopefully in the near future, people will see be seeing more of me. <laughs> I'm open to it. I can tell you that for sure. So if in case someone is, and I have a feeling this is going to really open you up, Kevin, but in case somebody is interested in collaborating or learning more, connecting with you, how do they do that? So as I said earlier, I'm on social media and on Twitter. I'm Kevin underscore Jackson. Kevin L. Jackson on LinkedIn and on Facebook. But if you just Google Kevin Jackson cloud computing, things things will come up. <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. I'm well, glad we got to do this. And, and I probably didn't went notice. over time, didn't we? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I always do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we wind up cutting these into two pieces. I want people to learn everything you want to give. And I really appreciate what you've given here today and what you give constantly to to the community. So thank you. Just oh. in case anyone could possibly not recall who we were talking to, Kevin L. Jackson, CEO <laughs> and founder, GC Global Net, Net, adjunct professor and author of Click to Transform. And I'm going to give you up a little bit more. You can find Kevin at Kevin L. Jackson dot com yes. because his wikipedia page was not enough um <laughs> linkedin or wherever as i'm sure you can guess by now wherever innovation is being done and don't forget to pick up that number one new release on amazon kevin thank you great for having opportunity thank you i really appreciate it and we'll talk to you again soon talk to you soon that's it for our episode with kevin l jackson and all right, that is all you need to know about supply chain tech for this week. Don't forget to get to supplychainnow.com for more Supply Chain Now series, interviews, and events. And now we have two live streams per week, the most popular live show in supply chain. Supply Chain Buzz is every single Monday at noon Eastern time with Scott Luton and me, or maybe even somebody else. Plus, our Thursday live stream to be named later, where we will bring you <laughs> whatever the hell we want. Hey, thanks for spending your valuable time with me. And remember, acknowledge reality, but never be bound by it.